Okay, guys, uh, I think we might get started. We've given the, the, the uh, usual couple of minutes after two o'clock before we start, but uh, there's a lot to, to get through, so um, we'll kick off. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, even if it is virtually. Um, you obviously can't beat the real world Learning Landscape Symposium, those of you who have attended in the past hopefully would agree, uh, but it's really brilliant that we have still managed to, to go ahead with an event this year, and I think anyone who was lucky enough to have heard Richard Lube uh, last night, um, that probably wouldn't have been possible uh, in real life. So um, actually in some ways it, it's worked out quite well for us. Um, I'm also personally delighted. Kate mentioned she was happy that she didn't have to stress about the weather. I was delighted I didn't have to stress about the car shares, which again, anyone who's been to the symposium will know we, I'm, we possibly still have people driving around the roads of the Burren looking for field trip locations. Um, so it's nice to yeah to ju just have to worry about the, the tech side of things which hopefully will all go okay um it's also lovely to be able to speak to so many people and um, again because we're online and um, there the venues in Kinvara only hold so many but um online you can speak to, to as many as want to attend which is really really nice um, and it also means that we've got some familiar faces who are very um familiar with Burn Bio and what we do and the symposium and then others who might be connecting um, with us for the first time. So welcome to all and it's amazing actually to see as, as we were getting started there and the chat was going with the various locations and um, brilliant to, to see people tuning in from such diverse locations. Um, so I uh, just wanted to mention I suppose before we, we uh, go, go on too much the format. Um, I'm going to talk to you for about 40 minutes um, and then we'll hopefully have time for some questions. And then between myself and our next speaker, uh, Lucy, there will be a five minute tea break, stretch break, loo break, call it what you will. Uh, we'll give you five minutes to just uh, regroup, I suppose. And what I'm hoping to uh, talk to you about in these 40 minutes is, um, let's get my screen to move on, uh, the Burn Bio story. So, like I said, some of you might be pretty familiar with it, um, but I'm going to also include uh, ways that people might look to implement some of what we've been doing in their own places. So hopefully that will be relevant and useful to, to everybody. Um, I'm also going to speak a little bit about some research projects that we're currently working on and some of the, the early kind of emerging findings from them. Um, but before we go too much further, I'm going to start with an adapted version. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how this will work online of, of an activity that we do usually to start a lot of our events and our programmes. Um, the good thing is, though, because it's on online, I won't get to laugh at your attempts. So, you know, you're, you're, you'll probably get on a little bit better than we do in real life sometimes. But it'll also give, um, hopefully, some of our international listeners a little bit of geographical context. Um, so at the start of a lot of our events and programmes, we ask people um, in small groups, five or six or so, to work together with a piece of string or wool or some kind of flexible material to try to create um, an outline of the map of Ireland. So from memory to um, see if you can on the ground create as accurate as possible um, an outline of the map of Ireland. And um, so if you have a notebook beside you and a pen or a pencil maybe give it a give it a shot see how you get on we have had some extremely varying results and um, all sorts of kind of weird teddy bear shapes and it's always interesting to see where it gets over um represented and, and underrepresented very often the rural midlands are, are very narrow and and not really thought all that much about but you know it just gets people thinking i suppose about place um but also introducing the idea of working in teams just in a very small way when we've got that done, uh, we then ask people, and it's something now I'm gonna ask you to do as well, is to think about that map um, and to think then in terms of yourself, where on that map you might consider to be your place, or maybe your place is off that map. Um, and that in itself is interesting. Might be, is it that you consider your place to be your house, your village, your town, uh, county, country, and um, maybe it's where you grew up, and um, maybe it's where you lived for a while, but you don't live anymore. Um, and the answers to, to these questions can be pretty varied, obviously, different for everyone, um, complex, uh, because place is quite a complex thing, um, but hopefully thought provoking. So it, it gets the mind moving in terms of, of where is my place? And um, do I have multiple places? 
And then I want you maybe to consider what is it about that place that connects you to it? Why is it that you chose that place? Why do you identify with that place and um, not somewhere else? And consideration of some of these ideas is really at the core of the Burn Bio story, which as I mentioned, I'll be covering um, in a few minutes. But first of all, I want to maybe give you my answers to, to some of those questions and um, to, to put this in a little bit of context and then to particularly look at those questions in light of COVID-19 and the impact that that might have had. So hopefully you have a map that looks very like this drawn on your page, as I said, when it's done in string, not always um, immediately identifiable, even which is north and which is south. So um, it, it also provides a bit of entertainment. Um, but for me, my places are Mead, uh, Tara, where I grew up, um, Salt Hill in Galway, um, on the west coast of Ireland, where I currently live and where I'm speaking to you from today, and uh, the Burren obviously where I work um, and where I plan and hope to live someday and um, all going well. So in terms of lockdown, COVID-19, um, being in lockdown in Salt Hill, not the worst place in the world by any stretch to be, a really beautiful little um, suburb or out outskirt of Galway City, um, about a couple of hundred metres from the Atlantic Ocean, plenty of places to walk, um, so you know could, could have been a lot worse. But actually uh, during lockdown, when I was confined initially to a two kilometre circle and then subsequently to a five kilometre circle, which was how um, the initial lockdown was managed in Ireland, I found I really missed trees. Um, and I love trees anyway, but I particularly missed them when it was really, really sunny because I am very fair skinned. I have red hair. I'm not sure if that's coming across on the video. Um, and I also have a very fair skinned and red haired little child. So um, the sun doesn't. Go well for us at all and um, so while everybody else was thronging to the beach I was trying to find somewhere uh, possibly to, to be outside but not get sunburnt um, and we don't have a back garden. So we went to discovering and um, exploring and, and looking around our place in maybe a way that we hadn't before and came across this park. Now I use the word park in a very loose sense and um, it's essentially a patch of green um, with some trees around it on a quite a busy road um, on a, a suburb of a city. So had driven by it many times before, thought nothing of it. Um, and again, that idea of, of driving and how that impacts on us engaging with our place. Um, and it's in the middle of housing estates, quite a built up area. Um, for those of you who know Galway, it's on Dr. Mannix Road, um, which is, you know, busy. You hear it on occasion mentioned when there are traffic reports. So, like I said, bit driven by it and hardly ever noticed it. Um, but we ended up actually spending quite a bit of time in this park. Um, beautiful trees and beautiful shade, perfectly suited to what we needed at that time. And as I lay there, looking up at the leaves and the sky, I started thinking, how do these trees survive all of the building and development around them? Uh, how has this patch of ground survived? Um, and what did I do? Which most people would probably do. I googled it and I came up with a few answers. Uh, discovered that this area was actually once part of an estate, um, an estate in the old sense with a, an estate house and lands, um, and that the house is still there, Lenaboy Castle. Um, it's called Still Standing. Unfortunately, it's quite well fenced. So we, we again, we went exploring and tried to get a look at it, but couldn't get a proper look. So I googled a picture. Um, but, you know, started thinking about this place and, and this estate and the people who had lived here and interacted with it through the years. Um, and Google also told me, very interestingly, that the original estate gates are actually still standing. So they're here on Lower Salt Hill Road, which is beside Morton Supermarket, for anybody who knows Salt Hill. Um, and, you know, again, you're passing by them and possibly thinking they look a bit odd, but, you know, nobody really knew, uh, not well, I didn't know exactly what the story was with them. And then, of course, because we were on Dr. Mannix Road, I said, oh, God, I wonder, had he something to do with the castle? Did he live there? So I Googled Dr. Mannix. And as it transpired, he was actually um, a Catholic bishop and archbishop of Melbourne for 46 years. So not really connected to, to the Lenaboy Castle, but interesting nonetheless. Now, I've lived in Galway on and off for 10 years. I have heard Dr. Mannix Road. I have, um, I actually live on, on a road, Lenaboy, um, and 
hadn't thought enough about them, to be honest, hadn't really uh, engaged deeply with these places, as I'd often been just driving past them, looking out from the car, going somewhere else. And that was another uh, real learning piece from the kind of COVID experience. We walked roads around Salt Hill that we had never walked before and possibly will never walk again because they're just not nice to walk on because there's so many cars and they're so busy with traffic. Um, but when the cars are taken off the roads, we walked and we discovered beautiful trees and gardens and old houses. And um, at the start of lockdown, when all of the cherry and apple blossoms were in bloom, uh, we were kind of making our, our roots to, to try to find the most beautiful trees. And it really, it changed my engagement with the place um, quite significantly. And I do think that having been forced in a lot of ways to connect um, more deeply with some of the, the elements of this place, um, I see it a little bit more now as home than I would have, um, and it's less of somewhere that I'm living while I'm looking for my forever home. Um, but what I think is really interesting and really key to, to what Burn BO is about is that if anybody decided they were going to develop that park or cut down those trees or get rid of these gates, I would be immediately involved in a, an action or I would organise myself an action to stop that from happening because they mean something to me now. I have a connection to them. And that really is what uh, Burn Bio Trust is all about. So we're an independent membership charity and our mission is connecting people to their places and helping to identify our roles in caring for them. So, you know, it's, it's pretty simple, connecting people to places, facilitating that um, or enhancing the connection at times um, and then looking to maybe see if we can get involved in, in looking after these places for the future. And how we do this is under the umbrella of place-based learning. Um, and for us, a definition that works, and there are many definitions floating about, as there are often with these kind of things. But for us, we, we describe it as learning about place, through place, and for the place. So, you know, it's, it, it's at the core of, of absolutely everything that we're doing. So I'm just going to give you an overview, I suppose, of some of the work that we've been doing with the Burn community since 2008, when the trust was officially registered as a charitable trust. Um, and our work could be described as falling under, I suppose, the four to five broad headings of education and learning, active conservation, research and advocacy. And then there are uh, different programmes that are kind of meeting some or all of these different topics. And I'm just going to start by mentioning maybe one of our key programmes, um, which actually has grown into a suite of programmes, and it's the Archbio programme. So Archbio for the non-Irish uh, speakers among us means living place, where the word arch is place and bio is living. So this works on, on two levels, I suppose, um, in that these are the places that people are living in, but also recognising that they are living places, that they're changing, that there are things living and, and happening in these places around us. We're impacting on the places and equally, hopefully, they're impacting on us. So in terms of the Archbio programme, like I said, it's now really a suite of programmes. We have an Archbio primary, an Archbio secondary and an Archbio community. And our primary programme is working generally with children from about 8 to 12. And secondary might be 14 to 16 year olds and then community is, is the, the community more broadly. And essentially, it's a local heritage course. It's teaching people or sharing with people tools um, how they can learn about their local built, natural and cultural heritage. Um, it's inquiry learning and that's really, really important. It's not lecture, it's not point and talk, it's skills built, uh, skills based, sorry, where you're, you're essentially at getting people to ask questions like I did about who was Dr. Manick and how are these trees here um, and then hopefully um, providing the tools or coming up with the tools together to find answers to those questions. And then really fundamental to the whole Archbio approach is that it culminates in a stewardship project. So stewardship really is about people being empowered and facilitated to take action on issues that matter to them locally. So for each of those programmes, the primary, secondary and community, it's all really focused on trying to address and maybe identify areas that you think could be improved locally and then taking action on that. And one of the, the really nice things about um, how the Archbio programme has developed First of all, is to mention that, you know, while we have pulled together these activities, these are things that we've picked up from symposia through the years and other training events and other educators, um, David Sobel and Richard Louvre among them, who, who are speaking at this event. 
Um, and also the really nice thing about it is that it's now um, at a point where it's completely transferable. So the activities could be carried out anywhere in Ireland for sure and potentially other parts of the world we might have to look at just tweaking some of them but the concepts would stand um, no matter where you were they, they could be put into action and the same learning could occur. And you know it's, it's really about encouraging a sense of informed pride, ownership and responsibility among the communities of places wherever those places happen to be. So just to, I suppose, give it a little bit more um, con like specific examples of, of what it is I'm talking about, some of the activities that we would do as part of the Autobio programme. Um, this one is a, is a real favourite, really simple, um, just basically to look at your local map. So the Ordnance Survey map is a real key tool um, with so much information on them. And, you know, it was interesting when we were confined to our five kilometres, we focus when we're, we're looking at the Ordnance Survey maps on a five kilometre radius. Um, of where the, the person is living or, or maybe the school if we're working with younger uh, a younger group and we just look at the map at all of the features that are on it we get you to circle in red what you didn't know about before um, and in green what you did and it's really interesting surprising sometimes maybe upsetting but you, you can't let it get you to too much to see actually how little people know about what's very close to them and um, that the archaeological features or maybe the uh, the biodiversity or place names or, or other kind of features of their place. So that might be one just example of an activity. Or maybe it's looking at this, the local census records. So in Ireland we're very lucky, the 1901 and 1911 um, census have been put up online, access is available to everybody. So to look at the people that lived in your place in the past, to try to get information on them. And, and there's quite a bit of, of information actually on these records, you know, their people's occupations, could they read and write, could they speak Irish and English, even the age, the, the family profile in terms of, you know, had you 15 people living in, in a house and so on. And, and a nice thing that we, we do on occasion is to follow the family from 1901 to the 1911 census, see the changes. And then also really powerful to see if there are families still living in the area and um, to see if they can find them or, you know, use it to trace people wherever they are. Again, simple make a model of a, of a local um, monument. So this is a, a really nice uh, Fulluxfia, a Bronze Age cooking site that one of our um, primary school kids did at one stage. And what we do with these as well, which is really nice, is we then get whoever has made the model to give their peers a tour of their site. So again, it's peer learning. And you know there are a whole suite of these types of, of, of learning methodologies and activities uh, built up over the years. Art, you know, again, looking to try to engage as many different aspects of learning to appeal to as many maybe of uh, the uh, the participants as possible so here's a nice poster of a, a burn ecosystem which you have the young people learning about it and equally then kind of um, having an artistic expression on it another nice activity works with all age groups these kids here are in gort and um, they have old photographs that we just got from the uh, from google really of, of old images of gort and, and they're also some really nice um archives of images that you can access and they just go down and they they uh, they check the changes and sometimes what's what's interesting is what hasn't changed so in Gort in particular the, the buildings are the exact same in the photographs and um, what's different is actually the cars and, and how we're using the place but to, to look at that and to to just discuss it look at it critically or maybe it's looking at your biodiversity uh, the, the biodiversity data center again an amazing resource uh, where you can look at the species that have been recorded in a 10 kilometer circle or a two or square, sorry, or a two kilometer square. Um, and again, maybe to look at the list, see when they were recorded, see if they are still in your area. You know, there are projects that can build out of each one of these really small activities. Or maybe with the, with the, uh, the community there, they had very specific skills requirements. They were looking to um, engage in more pollinator friendly planting. So looking at facilitating those kind of um, trainings for groups that, you know, whatever it is that is needed in that specific area. So building out of these Autobio programmes, we um, decided we'd like to share, which is what this event is about. The Learning Landscape um, Symposium is all about sharing what we've learned um, and, and equally it's, it's a real key event for the Burnaby Trust staff, so as we can learn from others. Um, and we also run a week long or in, in other years, we've run week-long um, courses on Autobio training. And they're, they're 
very interesting and fun and, and, and aimed quite um, specifically at other educators that can then take these kind of principles back to wherever it is they're, they're working. Um, and then alongside that, then we've created a toolkit which is available uh, to download for free on our website. And I'll, I'll give you the web link later, or you can buy a hard copy, which has just goes through um, a section or a selection of the, the activities that we would use in, in our Autopio program. So if, you know, the whole purpose, I suppose, of the training element is maybe to get people to, to start looking at implementing place-based learning in their, in their area. Um, and if you were to get started, one really nice, relatively simple start might be with just a walk series. So for us, um, I think from the past 10 years, the first Sunday of every month, um, there has been a walk scheduled somewhere in the Burren and um, on, a, on a topic, again, covering some aspect of built natural or cultural heritage. Um, and they're extremely popular. And um, I've gotten to see some beautiful places and learned an awful lot um, from a very diverse uh, group of people. So a lot of our walks now are actually led by farmers um, who have huge pride of place and, and a vast amount of knowledge on this place because obviously they're engaging with it um, on a really frequently, a, a daily basis. Um, so it's, it's about information sharing rather than, you know, covering the vast uh, swathes of the country, although sometimes we, we do get a feral leg stretch as well. Um, so again, a really nice um, way of, of just starting to get to know your place. And it mightn't be that you go for, for some, or the, you know, once, once a month to start with, but maybe even once a season to just get out, to get somebody to, to share what they know or a group of people to share what they know. And then connected to that are the, uh, the tea talks. So um, these are winter months and you can see here a packed hall um, in deep midwinter. There's, there's enough coats there to tell you, despite the fact that there's a blazing warm fire and um, it, it was a cold evening and um, we get big crowds. People turn out to hear about various heritage topics or, or maybe um, locally specific kind of topics of interest. Um, it's a really nice way of bringing academic research often back to the community. So the, the burn is quite researched um, and it's nice then to be able to, to bring that information back and share it. But as I said, it's also other, you know, farmers or photographers or, or different people locally who have something to talk about. But what's really key uh, with these events is that, as it says there, it's also a community gathering. So people come together to have a chat, to meet their neighbours. Um, and, and to hear what, what's being talked about. But, you know, the, the social element is every bit as important and maybe for some more important. So looking at, again, community building and uh, community connecting to places. Um, the, the kettle goes on at seven and the talk starts at half seven and the kettle and the tea is important. It's a tea talk, not a heritage talk. And even that, if you're advertising something, you know, if you say heritage talk, you'll get a specific um, audience. Whereas if you can just make it appealing to maybe a broader audience, uh, you might might get a few more to come along. And then we have another community within our Burnbio community. Um, our Burnbio conservation volunteers, over 100 people, um, most years it, it, more than 100, would get out um, and actually do something. So, you know, get roll up their sleeves and, and, and work on um, action projects in, in the Burren. Um, litter picks, working on archaeological digs, uh, rebuilding stone walls. There's quite a few of our volunteers now also who are um, working on biodiversity monitoring projects um, and they are housed within the Burn Bio organisation but also they're, they're quite a, a separate group in that they have their own committees, they decide all their own projects and, and are, are self-led group which is, is very important and also obviously the learning piece is, is there is, is very important that you know if you're doing a litter pick we'll also maybe have a marine biologist or an ecologist along so that you're you're learning while doing obviously for the archaeology it's led by an archaeologist so it's it's more than the, the action the action is one thing and um, but you're also learning and, and keeping with that place-based learning theme and we were delighted to see our, our uh, conservation volunteers trialing post-covid um conservation volunteering recently now I have to mention they were perfectly physically distanced throughout the event and then just for the photograph lost the run of themselves and, and stood a little bit too close but this is potentially what um hopefully not for too long but you know we're, we're still going to be out there and if anybody has any witty or funny uh, captions for our conservation volunteering ppe photo please throw them into chat we'd be delighted to, to pass them on to them um and then the final piece uh i suppose of our work that I'm just going to mention 
is this idea of celebration. And again, it's, it's really important, even going back to the HBO programmes, uh, we do try to include at the end of each uh, programme some sort of celebration. So a graduation ceremony or, or a showcase where people can show off what they've learned, share it with others. Um, but then we also have two larger um, community celebrations. So Burn and Bloom, which celebrates the Burns natural heritage, the arrival of the beautiful um, flowers that the burn is so famous for, the gentian and, and bloody cranes bill and, and orchids and so on. Um, and that happens at the start of the summer and it's, it's moved a little bit over the, the last few years just to, to, try to, to try to get decent weather and when flowers would actually be in bloom, which is, is a whole other story. Um, and then our burn winterage weekend, which is at the other end, the October bank holiday, where we celebrate the unique farming traditions of the burn and actually the, uh, the story of Winteridge is, is really key to the whole story of the Burren. It's that farmers bringing their livestock from the lowland areas to the uplands for the winter, which is the reverse of what happens in most of the world, and actually is really the reason why the Burren looks the way it does and has the flowers that it has, because the cattle are up there uh, grazing during the winter, and it means come summer there's space um, and light for the flowers that the Burren is so famous for. So they're really interconnected and all parts of of the bigger story of this place. Um, and like I said, it's community celebration. So we move to different uh, communities each year and we're privileged um, to be able to join a different farmer each year. And um, you can see here, I think this is last year's with Winteridge Drive in Karen, where we uh, followed Aoife Ford, a young farmer, in, um, followed her cattle up to the uh, to their Winteridge. And you can see, not a normal day in the farm. There's a, a couple of hundred people following up behind her, but just to get to appreciate and to, and to see this, um, this part of the, the heritage that is still part of everyday life in the burn. So with all of that work continuing, uh, we're also looking further afield. Um, so since 2018, um, I've been working on an employment-based PhD project, which is uh, funded by the Irish Research Council. They've a, a very nice funding scheme where um, you can be an employee um, so continue to work in your organisation but it be funded to carry out research at the same time. So I'm based between uh, Burren Bio and the School of Geography in the, in the University in Galway and um, this is the, the lofty title of what I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm looking at community stewardship so what I've mentioned about communities maybe being empowered um, and facilitated in taking action locally and, and seeing whether our place-based learning approach has had a, a role in that or has had an impact. Um, and the first piece, as, as it mentions there, is, is trying to evaluate the impact of the 10 years um, that Burn Bio Trust had been in existence from 2008 to when I started in 2018, and then to look for maybe transferring this model or some of the knowledge that we, we have over those years to, to wider um, areas. Um, so the first phase of the project, I um, analysed feedback that Burn Bio Trust had received from various programmes over the 10 year period. Um, and there's some really interesting results that are useful for Burn Bio Trust, but also uh, would be really uh, useful, I think, for others that were looking to maybe replicate elements of what we're doing. And the first piece that might not seem all that exciting, but it, it tells another piece of the story of Burn Bio Trust is actually I had the time to sit down and, and pull together the various spreadsheets that we had of uh, participant numbers on that whole suite of programmes and others um, from the 10 year period to actually get a full picture. Um, and it might seem that that's an obvious thing that we could have done anyway, but you'd be surprised um, how busy you can be actually doing and, and with less time to sit back and, and, and work on these kind of research side of things. So that's a really positive uh, first outcome anyway of being um, involved on the research project, but I just have time to look at things in a, in a little bit more detail. And in terms of the, the numbers, um, and again, I suppose for somebody looking to maybe get started replicating uh, programmes in their area is to, to think about, you know, are you looking for reach? So are you looking to engage with a huge number of people, or are you looking to maybe engage with a smaller group of people on a more um, in-depth basis? And you can see, like, it, it's pretty stark in terms of the numbers um, where the, the greatest number of participants have been at Burn and Bloom and Winter Weekend, Weekend. Um, huge, you know, combined out their, their way out there. Followed by the walks. 
um, the talks then. We, we did at one time do um, school tours, so one-off burn visits, um, and we've kind of stepped back from that a little bit just in terms of capacity. We would find that there's a, a better impact um, if you have a more long-term engagement, so um, we, we've moved away from that a little bit. Um, the Archipio Primary, um, you know, there's, at this stage, we've another two years through of that, so I'd, I'd say there's a, we're at least at the, the 2,000 um, young people have been through the programme, which is, is amazing, really, um, to think. The, symposium and the training and again looking at events like that in terms of you know 500 and something people and um, but if each of those goes home and shares some of what they've learned with maybe 10 people in their community again the reach is is um is, is increased significantly uh, we do as i said at the start we're a membership organization and, and thankfully the membership numbers have gone up actually quite significantly again since um 2018 which is brilliant um, and, and we are, you know, rely massively on support from members and equally um, members can direct programmes and, and get involved in, in what it is that we're, we're working on. And then the Archbio secondary numbers, probably also because it's one of our more recent additions, so that the numbers there are a little bit slower, or a bit, bit lower, sorry. So in total, we're looking at, you know, 26,265 people, um, which isn't bad for a small organisation um, on the west coast of Ireland. And obviously then we also have um, online engagement and, and other kind of outreach and, and other programmes that wouldn't have been counted in this. Um, but just interesting to, to try to get a handle on that. And again, if you're thinking of kicking off with some programmes yourself, I would say keep records. Um, you think you'll remember things, but you won't. So um, definitely make sure you, you keep your records on, on what you're doing. And the next piece then um, of the, the project, and again, um, it was something that makes sense to do when we just really didn't have time to do up to this point, uh, was a kind of an, an overarching or a meta-analysis on all of the feedback that we had received um, from feedback forms, from all of those programmes that I mentioned to you from both children and adults um, over the 10 years. Now, unfortunately, we don't have feedback from every one of the 26,000, well, unfortunately and also fortunately, because I would not have liked to have had to analyze that many um, pieces of data, but we had 1,233 entries, uh, which I, again, put into a spreadsheet and did an analysis of to see if there were themes um, that emerged in terms of what people liked and didn't like and, and, and what worked. And, and maybe was it having an impact on their behaviours? So the kind of things I was working with, you know, these um, pieces, some of them longer, some of them shorter from this is a secondary school participant liked the variety and how interactive it was. A primary school participant loved one element of the course, didn't like another element quite so much. And um, say the symposium participant there that was, you know, talking about reminding them that they need to make it fun and um, that it was, helpful and, and useful and games and, and so on and uh, a training uh, article training participant that you know talked about how they really enjoyed getting outside and, and seeing things and experiencing the place so this is what i was working with um, and some themes uh, emerged i'm just going to take you through some of the uh, the kind of more interesting sides of that and the first one again if you're looking to replicate i think is, is really really worth um noting and um, that people really enjoyed that it was inquiry active learning and um, that it wasn't lecture style and that was was across the board um, in terms of all of these programs um, participants decide questions themselves and you know if they're particularly interested in one area they could spend a little bit more time looking at that and i suppose going back to me in the park it's you know dr mamex that I was lying there, it was relevant, and I, and I got to, to look it up there at there and then. The next theme that came out that, again, I think is, is really important and actually is possibly one of the, the really unique things about Burn Bio Trust, um, it, the feedback kind of showed that we really engage a very wide audience. Um, and I think part of that story is because we focus on place quite in quite a holistic fashion. So it's built natural and cultural heritage, how they interact how they are interdependent. Um, and I think very often um, when people consider place, uh, they maybe are just interested in the biodiversity and the environment, or maybe they're just interested in archeology. span um, But it's when they actually all come together uh, that you really get the true picture of the place. And you saw that from that young person's um, comment in the earlier slide that they loved culture, but didn't like flowers. So if you come and you're trying to engage them in their local place, and 
and your focus is entirely on one element of it, you might lose a chunk of your audience. Um, so, you know, there are a whole range of topics that people liked or disliked. Um, and again, if you go back to the park, if I had just been lying there and said, right, I'm going to try to find out all of the different tree species that are here, really interesting, really nice project, but it's only a piece of the story. And I would have lost, I think, some of the richness of that place and some of the, the elements that connected me to that place. Another one, again, that you saw mentioned uh, by one of the, the previous uh, pieces of feedback, but really came through across the data, was how important it was and how much people had fun. And um, that this can and should be fun. Um, and that, you know, it, it makes sense if people enjoy the learning, they're far more likely, I would um, argue, to have a, a positive reaction and connection to the place. If learning about a place is something that's boring and you know just another thing we have to do for school or, or whatever it is you, you know you're, you're probably not going to have the, the result that you're looking for and this was adults and children alike which I think is also nice that adults like to have fun too you know that it, it games and, and activities um, can also be really useful from working with adult groups. Again probably won't be surprised and we definitely won't be surprised to hear this after um, Richard's Lou's talk yesterday that people love being outdoors, that it really impacts um, on their um, experience of, of a program. And the more you can get outdoors, the better. And what's interesting as well though, is like for a lot of our primary school participants, quite a bit of what they do outdoors is actually only in their school grounds. It's just getting out to the yard, it's doing biodiversity surveys in their grounds um, or playing games outside. Um, but that ain't even had an impact, that they just liked being outside. And then obviously for, you know, the, the more kind of possibly more impactful is then when you have field trips and you get to visit the sites and, and really see uh, what it is you're learning about. But just being outside at all, I think, um, is, is of great benefit and something that people uh, responded really well to. And again, it's another thing I think that, that COVID-19 and lockdown has shown us is the importance of outdoor space and you know, I really did feel for people who were um, locked up in uh, apartments with, with no green or outdoor space. And I think it must have had an impact and made things that little bit more difficult for them. And then the final uh, theme that I'm just going to mention to you is, again, um, one that definitely it makes sense, but I hadn't considered. But if you're looking to replicate, um, is the importance of personality. So what we found from the feedback um, is that some facilitators just got across the board positive huge you know they were mentioned specifically um, as being really good communicators or educators or facilitators and I think that's important to mention that you know if you're going to do this just be careful about who you pick make sure you have the right people and um, that just because somebody has a PhD or you know is the person who's usually rolled out to talk about butterflies or flowers or whatever it is and um, they're not always the, the one who's best suited to speak to a group of children or a group of adults or, or, or so on. So we're getting there. Um, I had planned then for the next phase of my uh, research to interview participants, past participants, to just get a little bit more depth and to, to investigate those and other themes a little bit more. Um, but COVID has sent me online along with so many other things. So I have an online survey um, which is open at the moment. And I imagine that quite a few of you here who have participated in Burnview Trust events in the past have completed it because I've, I've had a, a, a great number of responses but I'd love a few more and um, but unfortunately it is only for people who've been at physical events so I'll pop the this, the, uh, the link into the chat at the end but if you have been at a, a physical burn bio event before and haven't um, completed the survey I'd love if, if uh, you would um because the insights that the participants have are really really useful and interesting and what they will be used with along with that feedback analysis is to try to come up with um, a package, I suppose, or a, a, a working document anyway, to start with how we might look to um, implement similar programs or programs that are adapted to the needs specific to, to new areas. And um, so I will be putting out a call um, in the coming months or if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, looking for new communities uh, within Ireland, unfortunately. I'd love to go to New York and Istanbul where I saw there are participants, but I don't think my research grant will, will go that far. Um, but to, to work with new communities to see if we could put some of our programs in place. What would it, what would it take? What, what uh, has to happen to, to kind of get 
place-based learning um, happening more broadly across Ireland on the ground. And also just to mention, there are amazing programmes happening in Ireland in other places. Um, and, and recognise that, but just to see if you know we could enhance it and maybe add in some of, of our experience to it. So just, I suppose, before I finish up, two uh, takeaways or, or nuggets that I think I'd like to share um, from my experience of working with the Burnbio Trust since 2012, um, um, which is, you know, it's, it's a long time actually now that I look back on it, um, and also from starting this, this research project, um, and it's really about if you're if you're thinking um, maybe about starting some place based learning programs in your area, just to bear in mind, um, they might be the obvious, but I think it's really important. And the first one is to try to keep it fun um, and that that might be achieved just by make sure, making sure it's sociable so that people have a chance to meet each other and have a chat. And I think what's interesting maybe about this online symposium is that's probably what people will miss most, that the physical symposium. Um, was brilliant for people meeting up after the events and we used to have evening events to facilitate that specifically where you just meet other people and, and have a chat and then you're then part of a community um, and Burn Bio is a community organisation obviously and um, we have a community of members and supporters and we work with and um, in various communities and it's really important to mention that people um, and communities are essential elements of place so when we talk about looking at built natural and cultural heritage we always have community at the centre of that. So it's about the interactions um, there, that, that how they happen. Um, and I, I think going back to my map um, that I started out with, where I said home was Mead, and I'm getting very close to the point where I've lived outside Mead longer than I've ever lived in Mead. So I left when I was 18, and um, next birthday will be out longer than I was in. Um, but Mead is still home, and I think about that sometimes. And, and for me, it, it, it has to be, I think, uh, the community. So my family and my friends um, are still there or connected to that place. Um, so that's kind of what connects me to it and, and still kind of holds holds me, I suppose. And um, so looking to, to create those opportunities for people. Um, and then the other piece that I just wanted to mention is if you're getting started to, to look to use the resources available. So don't reinvent the wheel. Um, as I mentioned, and I, the next slide I have a the link to it. We've, we've loads of resources for people to get started on our website. Other organisations have similar. Um, and also to look, again, resources, I'm also talking about human resources. So to look to your community um, and to see who's there that might be interested in, in getting involved with you or have something to share. And it, like I mentioned, it's not always the, the supposed expert, like for us, the farmers are key in our community in terms of um, the work that we do on HBO and the other programmes, um, or it might be the local artist or uh, the Tidy Towns group, or you know, just the, the resources that are existing within your community already. Um, and I think what, again, bringing it back to me in the park on that and, and the community resources is Googling was great and I learned something, but I would have loved, and I think I would have had a much richer experience, maybe with not as many facts, might be at a bit more colour if I'd met somebody who grew up here um, and been able to ask them about Dr. Mannix and Lenovo Boy Park and all of these places. So, you know, people have stories and actually very often are only dying to tell you them um, when you do ask. So, I finally just wanted to say thanks for sticking with me. Um, please do get in touch if you have any comments or questions on, on research or Burn Bio more widely. Um, you can follow me on Twitter where I put the odd place-based um, piece up every now and then. Um, that's a link to the resources I mentioned and as I said as well, if you have been at a physical event and you uh, haven't done the survey, I'd really, really appreciate if uh, you would take some time to do it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, see what Grania has to say to me. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned at the start that Grania was here co-hosting with me. So thanks, Grania. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Anya. That was absolutely fab. Thanks a million. Um, we have some lovely comments here, um, in, in, including a couple of private inquiries. If anyone has um, a question for Anya, you can, you can raise your hand and I can see you in Zoom or you can do it digitally or um, you can put your question into the chat box down below. Um, I, um, I think I have a, a comment here from Connie Neal who said your work is beautiful and she's loving the toolkit and the other resources. 
and I have put a link to the toolkit a few times in the chat and I'll put it in again at the end. Um, just trying to see now if anyone has questions here. We're not the most smoothest, but we're getting there with the, with the technology. <laughs> um, Anya, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm very, um, oh, David, David Eager has a question. Will I unmute you? I will. You can hear me now. We can hear you, yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank, thank you. Yeah, oh, it was a sort of technical point, actually, because uh, about 20 minutes ago, um, I clicked on a link that had been put up by one of you, and um, uh, a problem occurred in that uh, I then lost most of the screen. I could still see your faces, but I couldn't actually see the, the main display. But, um, uh, and I, I tried variously. It, it, it just told me that because I was... Um, uh, because somebody else was speaking, I couldn't actually get back into the meeting to see to see the pictures. But that's, that's just a technical detail. Maybe I'm the only person in the world who's ever had, experienced that problem. Sorry, I know it's not on the topic, but I'm really fascinated by by the talk, and I, I will. Um, you um, just just to to uh, Ain your name? Yes, you 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 said you um, can be contacted on on Twitter. Is there any other other way that you have I missed out? Yeah, I, I'll put them into the um, the chat here. So I, I have an email, obviously, at Bur it's basically my name, Anya, at burnbio.com and Twitter. No, I, won't I'll, see, I won't see that, you see. So we'll, we'll Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's not your problem. This is why I'm, <laughs> this is why I'm actually sort of interrupting a meeting to tell you this. We'll, we'll, uh, it may affect some other people as well. Will, will there be any, any, can we go on to the, 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 the main site uh, of the yeah. organisation and, and yeah. get, at, get at it, access you that way? Absolutely, and it, cool. it, it, it's simple in email address. It's my name, A I N E, at burnbio.com will get me anyway. Great, uh, David. I mean, I feel like I'm constantly having technical issues this last four months at, at, all, at every juncture. Um, Eleanor Turner has asked, um, When are you planning on working with the communities around Ireland and what kind of involvement are you hoping for? Um, do you just need a school to participate or an organisation interested in delivering the programme? Uh, thanks, Eleanor. That's, that's a good question. I'm hoping to put the call out near the end of this year, um, so November, December time, and then to start working, obviously all kind of coronavirus dependent, um, but to start working in January. Um, and no, it's, it's definitely not just schools. It's about, I suppose, the, the entire suite of, of programmes. So hoping... Um, hoping to uh, look at maybe a walks and talk series, a community um, celebrations, maybe conservation volunteering, um, and then the, the HBO pieces as well. So it's, and it, it's hard to know, and in some ways uh, it's hard to answer because uh, with all of this work, it's really about um, addressing the local needs. So looking at what, what exists locally and what could be supplementary um, and to see um, if there's something that we would have to offer or that we could share um, and then I suppose that post uh, working with those new communities to, to, to maybe then come up with a model where this could then be um, shared with, with all communities throughout Ireland that it wouldn't require me to be um, coming along as well and helping out. That's great Anya, thank you. I think we're having a technical difficulty where everyone can see David Eager's screen. Um, this has not happened to me before, so I apologize. Um, Tanya Jordan said, thank you, very interesting talk, um, Anya. Um, are the symposium sessions recorded to go back to later? They sure are. They are being recorded as we speak and they will be available on YouTube after um, next week when we kind of get them all edited and, and, and uploaded there. So we have our YouTube channel uh, Burn Bio Trust. So I'll include a link to that in the um, description or in the chat in, in, a, in a while. Does anyone else have any further questions for Anya or will we take a short break? I have one here from, um, there's just a comment from Rory. That was a really comprehensive um, presentation, Anya. Well done and best of luck. How do you think this approach could be rolled out in less researched areas? more isolated areas or regions where the social capital might not be as strong as it is in the burn? Great question. Um, how important is the identification of local champions? Well done and keep up the great work. 
Yeah, it's a brilliant question, Rory, and I suppose that's probably the question that um, made me start this project um, because we don't know the answer. And I'm hoping that um, by engaging with the, the new communities, we might get some insights into that. Um, I think it goes back as well, the, the interesting piece of the feedback in, in terms of the importance of personalities. Um, and you've mentioned there, you know, identification of local champions. Absolutely. It's all going to be key. Um, and it, it, like, I'm hoping it isn't, and uh, definitely I'm not preempting my uh, my research. Maybe it's a case that it just can't be replicated, and um, I'm going to do everything in my power to 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 hope that 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 doesn't happen. And that some, you know, there there's some tools, and it might come down to funding, or there, you know, there are various avenues to look at. Um, but really, that 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 question is almost getting to the the core of the research. Um, and trying to figure out, yeah, is it possible and what has to happen to make it possible? Um, so I'll get back to you in a few years, Rory. <laughs> That's fabulous, Anya. Thanks very much. Um, we might take a short five minute break and just conclude this session and come back at two o'clock for uh, Lucy O'Hagan. So there's no need to sign out. You can uh, switch off your cameras if you wish for five minutes and we'll come back um, at three o'clock, excuse me. Uh, to continue on with the second part of the session. Thank you very much, Anya. Thanks, everybody. Like to see you as always. <laughs>